Good. Can we give it up for uh, Allie Rose, Cameron, and Brooke again? That was awesome. It's the best Sunday at Inside Out is a baptism Sunday. I love it. And all the confetti. This is great. Uh, my name is Lauren. If we haven't met yet, I'm so glad that you're here. And over uh, the last few days, I've been thinking about how there are two types of people on vacations. There's those who plan and there's those who just show up for a good time. Show of hands, who in here are the planners? Okay. Yes. Who in here, you're just showing up for a good time? Yeah, okay. You're like, I don't want to plan. I don't want to know what's going on. I'm just along for the ride. I am a planner uh, through and through. I love to plan vacations. I think it's so fun. I look on Yelp at every single restaurant we ever consider. It drives my family crazy, but I'm like, oh, we can't go there. It has three stars. There's better options. Um, I love to look at the best place to stay, look at all the Airbnb options. It's just so fun. And actually, my friend, uh, Mackenzie, and I, we try to go on a trip once a year together, and we usually end up going to Orlando. We do the theme park thing. Actually, throw back to the last time I spoke, and I told you that awful first date story about Harry Potter. I was leaving to go with Mackenzie to Harry Potter World the next day, which is how that all surfaced. Um, so we like to go to the theme parks, and she, she's just here for a good time. She's along for the ride. She tells me the dates that work for her. She tells me her budget. She tells me the three things she really wants to do, and then I take it from there. I got a spreadsheet. I got all the passes in my phone, all the reservations linked to my magic band. I have it all, and I love it. I love every second of it. And I really love it for two reasons. One, because I'm a nightmare, and two, because I want to make sure that I'm getting my money's worth. If I'm going on vacation, I want to make sure that I'm doing everything possible. I don't want to come home and be like, oh, man, we should have done that and that and that. Like, I want to know that we did everything we possibly could in the time that we had. But even if I have a great plan, even if I feel really secure in that plan because I know what to expect, things could still go wrong, right? We know this to be true, that we could plan all day long for something and something could still go wrong. You could have great plans for making varsity. You could show up early to practice. You could bring your coach their favorite snack or something if you really wanted to go crazy. You could practice outside of practice. You could be the last one to leave the gym. You could do all the things, work so hard, and yet you could still get hurt. You could practice your audition for the school play more times than you can count. You could give it your all when you get there and someone else could still get the role. You could have the best five year, 10 year plan for your life and pray about it every single night. Say, God, this is what I want. This is, I got it right here. It looks so good, right? This is what I want. And it will still look differently, look different than you hoped. It's just life. It's how it works. But that last one is what I want to talk about for a little bit, about how sometimes we bring God into these plans, right? We have these plans for our lives, and we say to God, God, this is what I want, so make it happen. We kind of view him as this genie mentality of, okay, God, here's the plan. I did all the work. You're a busy guy. You're a busy guy. I got it. I did all the work. I have the plan. This is perfect. All you have to do is make it happen, and I'll be happy. You'll be happy. This is great. And then things don't go according to our plan, and you see, sometimes we view our faith as a tool that can help us get what we want. Sometimes we view our faith as just a tool to help us get what we ultimately want. We'll pray the prayer, we'll do all the things, we'll read the Bible, we'll have the most aesthetically pleasing quiet time ever and post about it. We'll do all the, we'll go to Inside Out, we'll go to church, we'll do it all. And in return, we expect God to give us everything we want. And that's actually the prosperity gospel mentality, which is this belief that I'll do everything right, I'll hold all the commandments, I'll do it all right, I'll play by the rules, I'll do everything I can, I'll try to be perfect. And in return, 
God will bless me. He'll give me all the money. He'll give me the good health. He'll give me everything I could ever want because I am holding up my end of the bargain. But we know that's just not how life works. That's not how faith works. And actually, that takes our faith, and it's not a relationship with God anymore. That's not a relationship at all. It's just a give and take. And faith is so much more than that. And so last week we looked at this verse, John 10, 10, that says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that they may have a life and have it to the full. And when we look at this, when we read this, we see this and we think, well, the life to the full that they're talking about must be the life that I want. Jesus is going to come. I'm going to believe in Jesus. And then he'll give me this life to the full. And it's the life I want. It's the life I hope for that I dream of. Because obviously there's no better life out there for me than what I've planned for, than what I want. And all I have to do is believe in God. All I have to do is pray. All I have to do is is go to church. And then I will get the life that I want. But I think when we view life like that, when we view our faith like that, when we view our relationship with God like that, sure, it might work out. Sure, you could pray for certain things and it will work out. But when that's all we want from God is for our stuff to work out, for our plans to work out, I think we're going to miss out. I think we're settling because there's a life out there that we don't even know about, a life out there that we can't even imagine. And so we settle and we miss out and we don't get to experience a relationship with God that we could. And so today we're going to look at a story found in Mark, and this is about a man who thought he was doing everything right. He was doing everything right, and then he has an encounter with Jesus that just changes everything for him. And so this is in Mark chapter 10. This is the message version. It says, as he, Jesus, went out into the street, a man came running up, greeted him with great reverence, and asked, good teacher, what must I do to get eternal life? What do I have to do? Is there three steps? Is there an amount of money you want? What do you need? What do you want? What do I need to do? This is the life I want. I want eternal life. I want eternity with you, so how can I get it? Should be easy, right? Jesus says, why are you calling me good? No one is good, only God. You know the commandments. Don't murder. Don't commit adultery. Don't steal. Don't lie. Don't cheat. Honor your father and mother. And I think this was kind of a trick question because Jesus knows in order to keep all these commandments, you're perfect. And the only person who's perfect is Jesus. So Jesus is saying, yeah, you know all this stuff, right? And the man says back, he said, teacher, I have from my youth kept them all. I'm perfect. Jesus looked at him hard in the eye and loved him. And when I first read this and I hadn't finished the story, I thought, wait, wait, wait. Did Jesus, Jesus love him because of his performance? Did he love him because he kept all the commandments? He did everything right. Is that why Jesus loved him? Did Jesus love him because he said he was perfect and he just wanted to know how to get into eternity? But I think, I think Jesus looks at him with love because he's about to give him some of the most freeing advice and yet some of the hardest advice he'll ever hear. He said, there's one thing left. Go sell whatever you own and give it to the poor. All your wealth will then be heavenly wealth and come follow me. And this man was rich. He had a ton of money. He was super successful. And he worked hard for his money. And Jesus is saying, get rid of it. Sell everything you own and then take all that money and give it away. Surrender it. It's not going to help you get into eternity. But what will is getting rid of all that and following me. And the man's face clouded over. This was the last thing he expected to hear. And he walked off with a heavy heart. He was holding on tight (laughs) to a lot of things. Wait, this verse is so good. He was holding on tight to a lot of things and not about to let go. He didn't want to let go. 
He worked hard for all the stuff he had. He had money because he was successful, because he was achieving all those things, and he didn't want to let go. And how often do we hold on tight to something, and we just don't want to let go? Even if we're being honest, even if Jesus himself said, hey, you got to surrender it. How hard would it be for us to let go? And maybe you hear this story and you think, mm, yeah, it's a stretch. I don't have a lot of money. I don't really care. Uh, and if I sold my stuff, it would make a whopping $12. So it doesn't matter. And I think for a lot of us, we probably don't really relate to this young, rich ruler. However, I think we all chase comfort. We all want comfort. And for this man, money was what brought him comfort. Success was what brought him comfort. But maybe for you, good grades bring you comfort. Wanting to, the hope and the dream of having a ton of money brings you comfort. Attention from others brings you comfort. Popularity brings you comfort. Constantly being in a relationship brings you comfort. All these things bring you comfort. They help you feel secure. But I think we're missing out. When we just want what's comfortable for us, and it's okay to want good grades, and it's okay to one day be, want to be financially secure, all those things are okay, but when we place our trust and our hope in those things, and that's what we hold on to, and if we're being honest, if Jesus was like, hey, you got to let go, we're like, I don't know about this, because the attention, the popularity, whatever it is, all that stuff, it, just, it matters a little too much. My identity is kind of wrapped up in that, if we're being honest, and I just don't know if I can let go of it. I don't think I can surrender it because that's where I feel secure. Because it's what I want. But comfort is only going to take us so far. Comfort is only going to take us as far as we and our finite brains can imagine. But you see, Jesus promises life to the full which is way more than comfort. And I think sometimes, if we're being honest, we read this and we're like, yeah, 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 that's cool, that's cool, that's cool. But still, the money, the fame, the attention, there's something there because none of us have, I mean, maybe you're famous and we don't know, that'd be crazy, like Hannah Montana. None of us have <laughs> the fame. We don't know what it's like to be famous, but when we look at it, oh my gosh, it looks amazing. So yeah, I want it. I'll take it. And maybe that's this life to the full that Jesus is mentioning, but I don't really care because there's something about fame that's enticing. So I want it. But what we don't see is the side to the fame and the side to the celebrities where they're, really, they're realizing, hey, there's actually more. This isn't it. Taylor Swift, who I love, she wins a Grammy for 1989, which was well-deserved. And she's up there, she's accepting this award, and I remember watching it, and I remember thinking, yes, Taylor, you got it. And she was this woman who was just so successful, and she worked so hard, she was so creative and so talented. And then a few years later, her documentary comes out, and she talks about that moment that to us, to me, looked like the epitome of success. That looked like more than I could ever dream of, one, because I can't sing at all, but that looks like something I could never achieve and something that's just so amazing. And she's talking about in this documentary, and she says, yeah, I get up there to accept this award, and I look around, and there is no one in the crowd for me. I don't have any friends there. I don't have any family. I leave that award show. I get in the car, and I genuinely don't know who to call because I was so focused on the success that I lost relationships in the midst of it. And so she took a step back, and she worked on her friendships, and she worked on her relationships with her family. Tom Brady, after winning his third Super Bowl, is on 60 Minutes. This is back in 2005. And the guy interviewing says to him, you have it all. You have the fame. You have the money. You have the talent. Every girl wants to date you. And Tom Brady says, yeah, but there's got to be something more. The guy interviewing him says, what do you think that is? And he says, I don't know, but I hope I find it. 
even him, who's at, he's at the top of his career. He's won Super Bowls. He has all more money than he knows what to do with. He eats almonds only, which is so sad, but he is fit. <laughs> and yet he's thinking there's got to be more to this. And I just don't want any of us in this room to get to the end of our lives and say, yeah, I had the money, I did the thing, I, I got famous, whatever. I had the success that I wanted. Everything went perfectly, but there has to be more. And I believe that this life to the full, this is the more. This is the life that we can't even fathom. This is the life we can't even envision in our head, but Jesus has in store for us. And I don't want any of us to miss out on this. But this life to the full, this is a conscious choice we have to make. This is a decision that we have to make that we're gonna do whatever it takes to experience this life to the full. And that might mean we have to give something up. We might have to let go of something that we so desperately want. And we can work towards goals and we can hope for the best and we can pray for these things and that's all okay. But if we're holding on so tight that we're real willing to miss out on this, then we're in trouble. And so I don't know what that is for you. I mean, we could spend an hour times seven probably and go around this room and everyone could stand up, and this would so like be brutally uh, embarrassing. And you could say, yeah, this is, this is what I'm putting my hope in. This is what I'm putting my security in. My identity is in this. But I just want you to think about this question. That if you were face to face with Jesus, and he said, let it go. Give it up. Surrender it and come follow me, what would come to mind? Something came to mind for you. And I just don't want you to be 10, 20, 50 years down the road and think, gosh, I wish I learned to surrender it back then. Gosh, I wish I didn't miss out because I was so caught up in wanting the success in wanting the popularity in wanting to impress the people around me in wanting to impress my family. I wish I hadn't cared so much about that because I missed out on what Jesus had in store on this life to the full. The message version of John 10.10 10 says this, a thief is only there to steal and kill and destroy. I came so that they can have real and eternal life, more and better life than they ever dreamed of. And this feels crazy. If I'm being honest with you, this feels crazy to me. Because I truly think that I can dream of the best life for me. I can dream of the best plan for me. Yet Jesus says, no, 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 no. You don't even know what I have in store. You just have to trust me. And you just have to surrender the plans. So I want you to think about that question on the way to small group of what is it? What is it that if you're being honest with yourself, and you don't need to share this in group, this is just between you and the Lord, but if you're being honest, what is it that you have to let go? What is it that you're valuing more than this life to the full that Jesus promises? So I'm going to pray for us, and then you'll head to group. Father, thank you so much for this day, for a place where we can come to worship you, to learn more about you, God, to grow in our relationship with you. And Father, I'm just so grateful that you're not just a God who wants our prayers and our perfect quiet times and our performance. But God, you want a relationship with us. You want a friendship with us. You want to offer us more than we could ever imagine. And I just pray that we don't miss out. God, I don't want anyone in this room to miss out on all you have in store for them. So, Father, if there's something in our way, whether we know it or not, if there's something that we're holding on to that we just can't let go, God, I pray that you give us a discernment to realize it, and, God, that you give us the courage to let it go, to trust you, to trust your plan, to believe that what your son said is true, that you want to offer us life to the full, an abundant life, more than we could ever dream of. 
So God, we thank you for that truth. We thank you for this day. It's in your name we pray. Amen.